The fantasy news must flow! Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody to another episode of Fantasy News. I am your disheveled goblin host, Daniel Green, and today we have one of the girthiest thickum boys of fantasy news we've ever come across. So let's go ahead, smack that booty, spank those books, and jump on into the fantasy news. And we're gonna be going ahead and kicking it off today with some incredible updates from Christopher Paolini, the author who has a nostalgia string directly tied to all of our childhoods. A majority of our childhoods. And the first and biggest piece of news, in my opinion, is we are getting a brand new spinoff. Hey Daniel, I'm gonna stop you right there. I got this. 2023 is the year of Paolini. What do I mean? Well, on August 25th, uh, Books A Million is releasing a special edition of Aragon with a different cover and a new introduction by me. Also on the 25th, Random House is releasing a repackaging of the entire inheritance cycle with new cover tweaks and text, exclusive previews inside of uh, the other big book coming out later in the year, and exclusive in-world content. So be sure to check that out. Then on May 16th, my newest Fractalverse book, Fractal Noise, is coming out. And shameless plug here, this past week, Publishers Weekly actually gave it a starred review and said that it was sophisticated. So, um... I'm happy. On August 22nd, Barnes & Noble is releasing their collector's edition of Aragon, which has a full-color portrait of Brom right inside the cover. Again, a new introduction by yours truly, and it's just gonna be a lovely, lovely package. And now we come to the big stuff. On November 7th of this year, we are getting a 20th anniversary illustrated edition of Aragon, which has over 50 paintings, drawings, all sorts of pieces of art in it. It's absolutely gorgeous. Uh, Siddharth, the artist, did an amazing job. And this is stuff, you know, it's full full scale spreads. This, and the, the book itself is wide format. So the, column, the text is in two columns and it's just absolutely stunning. You can see some examples of the art online if you want, and it is available for pre-order. And then of course the big one is also on November 7th, Murtag. My latest full-sized entry into the world of Aragon. And yes, it is a direct inline sequel to the Inheritance Cycle. It's from the character Murtag's point of view and continues a lot of the storylines and themes from the Inheritance Cycle. And I'm really, really proud of this book. Uh, I think we got an amazing cover and my editor has been saying very nice things about the story and the characters from day one. So I can't wait for folks to read it. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna be a busy man this year. Not as busy as Sanderson, but pretty busy. So back to you, Daniel. And yeah, that happened well late in the evening editing fantasy news. I still can't believe it. And it's so cool. But my initial transition of my coverage no longer works here. So I'm just going to say I was setting up a joke where there's another book that's coming out later in the year, November 7th, that I was also going to say, hey, what a coincidence on. But now it's like, how, how do I follow up Christopher freaking Paolini? Thank you so much, Christopher. Back to the fantasy news. What's this though? You want another book to buy on November 7th? What a weird specific request. And what a weird coincidence that we are also getting the next book from Travis Baldry on November 7th, titled Bookshops and Bone Dust. Important note for Legends and Lattes fans, this is going to be a prequel to that story, which actually seems to be the right direction narratively to go. And I'm really excited to explore more. And I'm really excited tongue twisters today. And I'm really excited to explore more into our beloved orc's past. But going from one extremely non-problematic author to an extremely problematic author news story, that's the connection we're using, I guess. We are getting a manga release of some HP Lovecraft stories adapted to the medium. This will be an adaptation of The Shadow Over Innsmouth, which I personally have not read, but the art style that is on display already is quite impressive. And don't worry about your wallet. This one won't be released November 7th. It'll be a week and a day later, still on the same paycheck period, November 15th. <laughs> Now, Christopher Paolini doesn't get to claim to be the only author stepping back into a beloved fantasy world with their next entry, because we have seen V.E. Schwab announce that she is going to be setting a new series within the Shades of Magic world with the first book titled The Fragile Threads of Power. And no, don't worry, this isn't going to impact your wallets in November. It'll be over a month earlier, October 3rd, but this is going to be a busy Q4 for fantasy fans. And we have seen sub I just bumped everything. 
And we have gotten the good news that Subterranean Press will be releasing their special edition of Nona the Night. And it's coming out September of this year. And don't worry, it's $195, meaning it's just enough to make sure that the books you'll have to buy after this are even more painful. <laughs> But going ahead and getting the quickie news out of the way, we had three pieces of cover reveal news. One from Brandon Sanderson in the UK cover of Tress in the Emerald Sea, another from Rooks and Rose, which looks damn purple. And finally, we had Gene Wolfe's The Dead Man and other horror stories, the latter two of which will be released in August and June of this year. There are only a limited number of the hardbacks of this Gene Wolfe collection, so if you're a big fan, you might wanna jump on it. But let's go ahead and get out of all of this spending money news, oh my God. But first, a quick word from today's sponsor. And this video is brought to you by Wraithmarked Creative and their upcoming Kickstarter for When the Swords Fall Silent. This is an assassin theme anthology with a twist. 100% of the net profit Profits from this books are going to benefit St. Jude's Hospital. That's right, you can get your fantasy fix and help sick children. Win, win. Featuring 14 different stories from 14 different artists, When Swords Fall Silent hosts a plethora of dark and dangerous tales from traditional and indie heavy hitters alike, even including the likes of New York Times bestseller Michael J. Sullivan, Terry Mancor, and more. Customized from head to toe in Wraithmark's usual just knock it out of the park style. You've seen them here before on the channel. The book features a gorgeous illustrated dust jacket, a black and red foil case, and a custom character illustration for each story. Plus, if you were a fan of the bookmarks you recently saw here on the channel, every book comes with a gorgeous foil bookmark that is worth checking the Kickstarter out for alone. And uh, I have it on good authority that if you're a fan of the Ryuria revelations, you might want to check this one out for a bit more of a look into Royce's shadowy past. I said that a little too seductively. So if you would like to get your fantasy fix with a fantastic foray into the fantastical, all you have to do is go ahead and check out the Kickstarter link down below and back the project today. Back to the news. And we are gonna be getting into a bit of controversy around the Goosebumps series. Now, at first you may believe this is old news because these changes that allegedly happened in terms of censorship for the Goosebumps stories actually broke in 2018. But the update here is that the author has come out and said he was not aware of or approved them. He has tweeted out and reposted articles that have been correcting this, explicitly saying, the stories aren't true. I've never changed a word in Goosebumps any changes were never shown to me. Now, this is obviously connected to the recent story that I wasn't able to give my full thoughts on because Murphy Napier was wonderfully guest hosting the fantasy news that week, but censorship of books has been in the headlines quite a bit, where recently most headline getting, we saw that the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory books have been getting changed up by that publisher with it seems permission from the estate, from the author. If you're going to change the wording in books and that author is alive, you damn better sure get their approval if they're deceased at least work with the estate or whoever has the rights. I'm not fully against removing some very offensive words from modern things, but I also think context is important. And there's also lessons to be learned from the language we use now versus the language we used to learn. And that can be a very valuable conversation. So if you're putting a edited version on a shelf, one, it should be denoted on that book. It's an edited version, clearly and plainly. And it should be next to an unedited version. Now, as for Scholastic's response to this, they had to Say. For more than 30 years, the Goosebumps series has brought millions of kids to reading through humor with just the right amount of scary. Scholastic takes its responsibility seriously to continue bringing this classic adolescent brand to each new generation. When reissuing titles several years ago, Scholastic reviewed the text to keep the language current and avoid imagery that could negatively impact a young person's view of themselves today, with a particular focus on mental health. Now, despite everything I said there, I'm also not against what they're pushing forward in terms of especially mental health representation, which is something we've seen evolve massively since, of course, even just the Goosebumps books came out. It's okay, in my opinion, if you get permission from authors or whoever is in control of the rights at this point, 
to edit books, as long as you make it abundantly clear to where you cannot make the mistake of not realizing what you're reading when you're reading it, to change books. I used to have a different opinion until I talked to enough people who have kids who have to like last minute scramble as they're reading something, try and like fix it so that's appropriate for their child, or even make sure their kid isn't reading a book that can teach them a word they don't wanna know at a certain age. But I do not want the conversation of why those things needed to be changed to ever be minimized because that's the important lesson to take away. And this is also a story where I do not feel there is objective right and wrong answers. Art is almost never involved in objectively right or wrong answers. It's all mushy and subjective depending on your core values and beliefs. And that's why if you inevitably end up debating this topic with somebody, you're going to wind up down a rabbit hole where you're quickly talking about like morals of the universe and things. It's a very pleasant debate to have with someone who can maintain a debate without descending into arguments, but the internet's not very good at that these days, so good luck having that on Twitter. Getting back on topic here though, for specifically Goosebumps, I wanna say, I hate the way Scholastic is handling this. It's not as approved as a seemingly the Willy Wonka one was, and here, the reason it's having to be a debate like way later on is because it seemed to have just gone under the radar and there wasn't like a clear, hey, this is an edited reprint, and instead they just tried to like sneak it in, which is an awful way to handle handle this in my opinion. So it's a gray situation for me, but in this case, absolutely not. And did you want to talk about Funko Pops? Let's talk about Funko Pops, shall we? The most useless plastic garbage on the planet. Yay! Well, it appears $30 million worth of Funko Pops are headed towards the dump, with the company deciding it is cheaper to just throw away a massive portion of their stock than continue to store it, which is actually not that uncommon a practice and was even recently seen with Magic the Gathering cards in bulk. And I have said so much about Funko Pops that I could reiterate here, but I don't want to be redundant. Actually, future Daniel here who decided to be meaner about this. No, you were stupid to buy Funko Pops in the fucking purse first place. First place, they're useless plastic garbage. They're gonna end up in the bellies of whales for centuries. And now you've been told by the actual company who makes them that yes, they are worthless fucking trash. And you spent your hard earned money on it and you should feel just about the same as those Funko Pops feel in the dump, cold and dead inside. You could have supported small businesses that are making all kinds of cool merch for your favorite fantasy series just by bothering to take the time to go to Etsy and putting the name of a series you like. But no, instead you decided to funnel money into a gargantuan corporate conglomerate putting out plastic garbage that they are now, I wanna reiterate, explicitly telling you is garbage not even worth the value of keeping on a shelf and yet they're gonna keep selling them, you're gonna keep buying them because consumerist bullshit. But Daniel, you have a Pikachu on your shelf. Well, guess what? It was given to me as a gag gift because these Funko Pops are a fucking joke and nothing about them is actually valuable or useful. It's plastic crap and you have so many of them on your shelves. How embarrassing. Okay. Even if I collect Funko Pops, this is just a guy amping up an opinion to make a joke. But no, actually, f you. That's right, we're continuing this segment into a clip we're gonna create in Twitch. Actually, f you. You could have donated that money to charity, and now you are being literally told you lit it on fire and it's garbage and I know it's so lame to say oh you could have donated to charity but this is the one instance where you're literally being told it's all garbage even to the people who make it that's how bad it is oh my god so instead what I will encourage current Funko Pop collectors to shift their gaze towards if they're as bothered by this incredible amount of corporate waste as I am but before we get into a brand new fantasy news segment, I would like to bring you the quickie news today. The not quickie book news, but just general quickie news. And that is that we have gotten the premise for the new Alien movie, which is apparently going to be a group of young people on a distant world who find themselves in a confrontation with the most terrifying life form in the universe. Alien, that's that's the premise is alien. That's the premise, yeah, we're doing that again. But now we get to transition into a brand new fantasy news segment called What the F*** 
Okay anime slash manga. And I'm happy to say the first bit of what the f anime slash manga news is that we are getting an anime about someone transformed into a vending machine who then goes on a fantastical adventure. All right, yeah, that's cool. And I've reread this like six times. The title of this is Reborn as a Vending Machine, I Now Wander the Dungeon. This anime is scheduled to be released July of 2023. And that's a weird enough premise that I am 100,000% gonna watch at least the pilot. What the f Following it on up, this isn't directly anime or manga, but it's one of the little figurines that kind of fits within that broader umbrella of that aesthetic. And that is, well, let me just ask you a question. Have, have you ever been thirsty for Spock? Well, thank God that you're now covered because Star Trek has officially gotten the Bushido treatment. And I want you to guess just how fuckable they made Spock here on a scale of one to 10. Guess what? It's a solid 8.5. <laughs> Featuring at least triple Ds, if not more, this statue is described as known for being a friend of people of Earth with a notable spirit that values logical thinking, the Vulcan science officer. And I love that they have to screw around not calling it Boinkable Spock because they specify it's Star Trek, the original series, and she looks like Spock, but is Spock with titties though. <laughs> I am laughing pretty hard here, but Spock was already hot. I'm not judging anybody. I just think this is subjectively kind of funny and humorous. But at the same time, this is your thing. This is your thing. It's still better than Funko Pops. <laughs> All right, we're gonna leave the wild and weird space of fantasy news and go ahead and jump into the TV and movie news because it has been confirmed that yes, The Last of Us's viewership numbers just keep on rising with them not just passing a billion views recently, but we have seen episode eight hit a series high of 8.1 million viewers up a whopping 74% from its premiere. I'm gonna take this moment though to talk about the fact that I was so excited to watch the ending of this with Kayla blind. She didn't know how the series ended, but she had it spoiled for her and that sucks, not by me. So for anyone else out there who is able to watch it with their partner or they themselves does not know how Last of Us ends, please be extra careful to avoid spoilers. The ending is spectacular. That's all I'll say about it. And going in blind will make it so much more impactful. So if you don't know, or you know someone who doesn't know, take measures to make sure that ignorance lives on. A few times I will endorse ignorance. And something I didn't even know was in development from Apple TV Plus, which is still, yes, the worst name streaming service of all time, we have had the trailer drop for Silo, which is the first in the series that is also composed of wool and dust. I hope I'm saying that in the right order. And this trailer looked interesting enough that it has me going like, all right, I'm in. I will watch this for sure. And now those books are higher on my TBR as a result. Adaptations are good at getting people, whether they're good or bad, we don't know for this one yet, to at least get into the books with a good trailer. I am evidence of that myself, for better or worse. And for a piece of video game news, the release date for Bethesda's next big drop, Starfield has been announced, and it will be September 6th of 2023. Yes, as someone in my Twitch chat pointed out, this is American dating, not European. And as someone who loves space RPGs, this looks spectacular. I'm a little nervous to see it's from Bethesda, but I hope this is a return to form from them. Return to form from them. Tongues are annoying. But this has just been your latest episode of Fantasy News. And please excuse me while I go kill some Imperial scum. I don't know why it became a rainbow blade. I didn't mean to do that. I don't. Anyway, like and subscribe if you have not already and hit the Patreon if you'd like to support what I do here. I got books, I got upcoming books, I got special editions, and thank you to Wraithmark for being today's sponsor. Have a good one, y'all. Peace.